The Monerotopia Price Report segment is sponsored by Local Monero. Avoid using KYC exchanges. Buy and sell Monero directly for fiat, peer-to-peer. Aloha, Bobby. Hey, hey guys. Um, I don't know if y'all can hear me. I'm not able to yes. hear you through the StreamYard link. Um, oh, so I, I don't know. You. I'm not sure yeah. how this is going to work. Yeah, we Maybe hear you. send me a Telegram message if you can hear me right now. Yes. Yes, yes we, we hear you. Why can't you hear us? I don't know. Mm. Perfect. Okay. All right. Well, uh, that's, um, that's great. Then uh, I'll just go ahead and push with the price report. And uh, <laughs> if um, if y'all want to come in with some questions, I'll keep my um, my Telegram pulled up on another screen. So uh, today, um, I kind of want to talk more about macro today, particularly because next week there's a whole bunch of um, big numbers coming out. Um, so let's first, uh, we'll just start off with Monero. Nothing really exciting happening except for like the same trend is continuing. We just strength all the way up. Um, we're now trending on what was a resistance line. Uh, so that's lovely. We're still hanging out inside of this rising wedge here. Um, and it looks almost like we want to, it almost looks like we want to push higher and, and bump out of that. When you're in a bullish spot, it is very possible um, to actually break these rising wedges to the upside and then go even higher. Um, that does happen in bull markets. Usually, normally, rising wedges are going to be a bearish structure. Um, you're going to eventually break down to the bottom and, and then go down. But in a bear market, that's, you know, when you see rising wedges in a bear market, that's typically something you want to be worried about. Um, but to me, Monero uh, XMR BTC is in a bull market. So rising wedges in a bull market can very often be bullish structures and not necessarily bearish structures. Um, so yeah, there's not a whole lot going on here with uh, since last week for, for the Monero price. You can see uh, dominance took a nice bump here. Uh, and this is the weekly chart, so that's you know a very long time frame. Now, again, as we've been talking about, we are coming up on this on this long-term resistance line. Um, so that, that, again, it could pose some challenges once we get there. Um, the divergence is not too much happening. Um, Binance has actually been above uh, Kraken's price lately. Uh, that's with the volume adjustment. We take the volume adjustment out. <laughs> we, we get to see how Poloniex, for whatever reason, just, just tried to divert their prices down. Um, so, again, you know, the, the fact that Binance is actually doing volume above Kraken's price, this probably does have something to do with um, our continued strength our continued price strength. So yeah, with Monero, you know, there's not a whole, like I said, not a whole lot going on. Um, the uh, longs and shorts, they're, they're still basically at parity. There's about as many longs as there are shorts, but in reality, there's just very few positions open compared to uh, what we've seen from Monero in the past. Um, <clears throat> so before we talk about all the um, economic numbers that are coming out next week, I thought it would be a good idea to touch on the reason why we use log charts. There's often a debate, should you use log charts, should you use um, something else? And to me, the answer is pretty simple. This is the M2 money supply. Now, for those of you that don't know what the M2 money supply is, it's a measure of all the U.S. dollars in existence. And you could kind of put quotation marks around U.S. dollars. Um, so M2 money includes M1. So starting with M1 really is probably the best place. That would be cash, coins, and checking accounts. Now, they reclassified savings accounts as M1. Uh, it used to be classified as M2 money. Uh, they did that in the middle of 2020. So that made M1 spike up like crazy. Um, in fact, maybe I can show you that. Yeah, so here's, um, <laughs> so this spike right here, let's go to the log chart. Um, this spike right here was actually just the reclassification of savings accounts as M1 money. Um, OK, but anyway, so the thing is that M1 is all checking, all savings and all cash and coin. Um, M2 money includes time deposits that are less than a year. So you're talking about like CDs, money market accounts. And there's quite a lot of money wrapped up in all that. In fact, there's more money wrapped up um, as time deposits than there are as, like than there is in just regular cash and checking. So now the reason why we look at log charts is really simple because the monetary system is logarithmic in nature. Um, logarithms are how you deal with percentages. So like in, um, when you do like basic economics in college, whatever, um, you'll learn about how these equations are done and effectively log charts help you deal with percentage increases every year, as opposed to, um, I don't know, just, um, uh, natural, you know, natural scale. So the reason that we use log scale is because the economic system itself behaves logarithmically. 
it behaves as a percentage over year, uh, every year. They target inflation to be 2% every year. Um, so that's inherently a logarithmic, uh, logarithmic chart. So um, that's why we use log scale. But the other reason is also um, maybe we'll go to uh, a regular old, if I can find it. There we go. Here's the NASDAQ. Um, and actually, you know, maybe we should just go to the S&P 500 um, because that has a longer price history that goes all the way back to uh, the early 1900s. OK, so you're looking at a very, very large chart here of the S&P 500. And um, you can see I kind of, you know, drew some lines here, whatever. But essentially, you can see that this goes up in kind of almost a straight line over very long periods of time. Whereas if you change this to a regular scale, right, you can see that you just don't get any resolution here on the bottom. Like there's a lot of interesting price action happening down there, at least in terms of percentage, right? How price is changing as a percentage relative to um, to what it was previously. So you lose resolution on the low end uh, and then you only see the exponential part of that. Um, so you have to use logarithm because our monetary system is an exponential process. So um, sometimes it's reasonable to use a non-log scale. Like when you're looking at something like the dollar index or Bitcoin dominance, um, right. Those are charts that are range bound. Um, so they're not necessarily um, subject to the kinds of uh, uh, exponential process that uh, that most of the rest of the economy is. Um, so, OK, with that in mind, just so that you guys can can be aware, um, we have a lot of big economic numbers coming up next week. This is going to be a really big week for me personally uh, in in when um, when I rebuy, uh, if I intend to rebuy. So um, we had the producer price index. Uh, that was on Friday, so just yesterday. And that's the white line right here. Let me expand that. So that's the white line right here, and that came down. That's good. We want to see these inflation numbers coming down. That makes it so that the Fed can pause their interest rate hikes. Maybe they don't have to raise it as high. Um, so that came down. That's good. Maybe we'll, uh, maybe we'll also see um, these numbers coming down as well. Um, the core inflation is the main one that they look at. So that would be uh, the line in blue here. Um, that's that's the biggest number for the Federal Reserve in terms of what they're looking at for inflation. So on uh, Tuesday, we're going to get the producer price and uh, sorry, the consumer price index. And with that will also be the core inflation. Um, we're going to get the unemployment numbers. Now, I don't it's probably no one here really listens to uh, Jay Powell when he gets up and just talks at length um, about the economy. But in his last meeting, he talked about how unemployment and labor demand um, is one of the big things that drives inflation. There's a very high demand for labor and there's not a lot of people um, that necessarily want to go back to work. So um, that's that is causing a problem. There's not enough people producing all the stuff that we use. Um, so that's he kind of puts it in a corporate way that sounds nice, but really kind of if you read between the lines, he's kind of saying, yeah, there was too much mad gains happening. Um, <laughs> too many people retired early, uh, more than you would be expected, uh, more than would be expected from demographics alone. You know, um, people getting old and retiring. Um, so essentially, that was because of all the money they printed. So they're very they're very well aware of that. Um, so, uh, yeah, we've got the inflation numbers coming out. Um, what else do we have? Uh, the Fed meeting is on the 13th, so that'll be uh, well. They it's on the 13th and the 14th, but they release their um, their press releases on the 14th, uh, so that's a Wednesday. Um, so next week is just a really big week. If we see the inflation numbers coming down, if the Fed maybe only hikes 50 basis points or 25 basis points, maybe they throw the markets a bone. Um, maybe they give us some forward guidance that highlights the potential for pausing stuff like that. Um, that's that's kind of what we would prefer to see if you want to be in risk assets. Um, so then we could just go ahead and take a look at the crypto market and, and uh, as a whole. So, uh, you know, again, still things are just kind of moving flat, um, like we talked about last week, uh, mildly positive. You know, we had a bit of a dip um, this week and then it came back. So, you know, things are ultimately just flat for the most part. Um, you know, so that was total. This is Bitcoin right here again flat to mildly positive. Um, I want to also talk about Bitcoin dominance. In fact, what I wanted to show you guys today um, was to do some comparisons between um, between crypto versus the stock market and then also look at Bitcoin dominance with some adjustments made. So um, the, the line in orange, that's Bitcoin dominance. The line in gray here, that's going to be Ethereum dominance. And then green is stable coins. That's stable coin dominance. Now, um, there's a lot of adjustments that you can make. So if we make no adjustments and we just show 
let's remove stable coins uh, for now and remove ETH, Ethereum for now. Okay, so, you know, quite simply, this is Bitcoin dominance, right? Um, maybe we could try and draw some kind of trend line here uh, that could be possible. Um, but anyways, the point of this chart is not so much to, to try and draw trend lines, which we can do. Maybe we'll look at that in a second. But the idea is that we really need to make adjustments. There's about 20 to 25 percent of Bitcoin has been lost forever. By the time that Ethereum and Monero and these other coins came around, people had realized just how important it was to back up your private keys, to back up your seed phrase. In fact, seed phrases didn't even exist when Bitcoin was invented. So they had to make that because of people losing their keys. So the reality is that, um, OK, there's maybe 20 to 25 percent lost Bitcoin. There's who knows, maybe there's like 5 to 10% lost Ethereum and the loss of an arrow. So I say we can make this adjustment around 15%. What we're going to do is we're going to subtract, um, we're going to subtract those Bitcoin out of the equation. Um, and the other thing that we can do that people, uh, especially maximalists will say, Hey, it's, that's not fair. You have to subtract stable coins from the calculation too. Um, cause they're just, you know, on the one hand, they'll be like, no, printing stable coins doesn't matter. And that didn't cause anything to happen with price. And then on the other hand, they'll be like, no, 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 it's that's that's not real. Those aren't those don't count. <laughs> it's kind of like, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to have it both ways. OK, but anyway, so we'll subtract stable coins. We'll apply the adjustment for lost BTC. And um, the chart doesn't really change too much. Right. Um, let me do that one more time it's like that. So the reality is that stable coins aren't really affecting the dominance calculation that much, which I think is something important to point out because um, I've heard Bitcoin maximalists try and use that as an excuse. They'll be like, well, you know, you have to subtract the stable coins. That's not fair. Um, but when you do, you see that it doesn't actually make much of a difference. So the other thing is that um, I want to show the Ethereum dominance and also the stablecoin dominance because stablecoins are increasing um, as a percentage of the total market cap. Now, with Ethereum, I think it is fair. We should include total value lock. There's a lot of coins, there's a lot of tokens and stuff on Ethereum that do a lot of things. Um, and that does represent some kind of economic value. It does represent interest that people have. So we should include the TVL in Ethereum's market cap. Um, and you can see that, uh, you know, it's we're not really looking at that big a difference here. Um, there was a period of time where there was only about a 10 to 15 percent difference, this bull market between the Bitcoin and the Ethereum market cap. Um, so what I like to say here is I, I like to talk about when Ethereum gains parity, because it's not so much like people like, oh, the flippening, but that's that's more of a meme, right? What we're going to see happen here probably is Ethereum and Bitcoin are going to start kind of dancing, right? We'll, we'll see where they're they're sort of flippening each other for a while, but it's it's really more like market cap parity. Now, I tend to think that's actually that's going to happen here in the next few years. Um, Ethereum just serves some very basic needs, <laughs> needs, uh, desires of cryptocurrency, one of which is, let's be honest, degenerate gambling. Uh, I am no saint in that regard. Um, but Ethereum does do that. And it serves stable coins, um, which we can see here in green. So stable coins are increasing overall. Now, this includes um, uh, Tether, USDC, Binance USD, and um I didn't include DAI because DAI is pretty much backed by USDC and Tether and a few others. Um, so it's I just figured that, you know, the big ones just include the big ones. There's a bunch of other little ones out there, but they really don't make much of a difference in this chart um, just because they're such a small percentage. So that's what Bitcoin dominance looks like um, and Ethereum dominance looks like when you make these various adjustments. Um, the other thing, this is a chart that I, I think is just a beauty. Um, it's the Bitcoin divided by uh, the NASDAQ. Now. You can kind of see um, we're going to take a little a little historical look here. Um, so what we're looking at here is 2014 to 2015 bear market uh, and then the bull market that ensued. You can see that these levels here um, are actually quite remarkable. Uh, the way that uh, that price tended to come back to uh, to particular levels. So, for example, you can see here the, the peak in 2014. That became significant later on the very first pullback. So Bitcoin um, in 2017 broke through the, um, and again, this is a ratio. We're taking Bitcoin and we're dividing um, Bitcoin by the NASDAQ. So that means that Bitcoin is becoming uh, relatively more valuable compared to the NASDAQ um, as this chart goes up. And so you can see that, um, you know, this spot right here was, uh, was very important um, when the first pullback happened. And then you can see that the very first peak after Bitcoin broke through um, its uh, its previous all time high, uh, that next peak was a very significant spot. That was basically where the bear market bottomed. Um, and we can see this kind of all the way up. The next peak that happened, that ended up being the temporary floor that Bitcoin hit um, 
for uh, for the bear market. And then that was basically the floor in 2020 before we went on the next bull run. So um, this is a very interesting chart. I think it's I think it's worth anyone. Um, it's worth your time to look at and to really sort of scrutinize and, and see what kinds of trends you can find here. Um, so right now we're essentially sitting at the same levels as the little mini bull market that happened in 2019. We spent um, pretty much the last, I don't know, almost last six months hanging out um, in this zone where Bitcoin kind of peaked out in 2019, uh, June of 2019. And, um, you know, this chart, this doesn't look so bad. Like it looks like, okay, we had that big red candle right there. Um, it's hard to say exactly, you know, where things are going to go from here. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at the overall statistics. Yeah, those don't really tell us a whole lot either. Uh, at least at the moment, there's this chart doesn't show us too much for what price might do at the moment. Um, one thing I would maybe be a little bit concerned about is that this spot right here could now become oops, uh, this could now become resistance. One second. There we go. So essentially, we fell below uh, this pretty important. And again, this is a weekly view. So uh, the weekly close happened right there. It's a natural spot to draw this line. That was also kind of. Um, similar spot where we paused for a moment before going into the bull market. So my only concern is that this could become kind of resistance for some period of time. Uh, there's also the potential um, to actually come back down further. So that would be um, another minus 17%, not in the US dollar price, but again, 17% less valuable relative to the NASDAQ. Uh, we can do the same thing with total market cap. Um, let's see, we're on the weekly. So this is the total... Uh, crypto market cap divided by um, so we're actually dividing this by the Vanguard uh, total stock market value so instead of dividing by the Nasdaq we're just taking total and dividing it by all stocks uh, and that's what so Vanguard is one of those like aggregate what's the total value of um, of all stocks so um, you know we can do the same thing here and uh, it looks pretty much the same although you'll notice that um, we still have a little bit of ways to go down before hitting the um, the 2019 uh, blow off the little mini bull market um, right there. So it's foreseeable. It, it's reasonably possible that we could come down here, especially because the stock market has been showing significantly better strength relative to BTC. Um, so let's find my stock market charts. We'll look at the NASDAQ. Um, actually, no, we'll look at the S&P to start with. Go to a shorter time frame. So, okay, this is the S&P uh, 500. And you'll notice kind of right here, we topped out um, as we touch that uh, resistance line, this is the overall bear market resistance line. Um, I do think we're going to break this at some point, but I also think that um, this is a bit of a rising wedge structure. It's, it's not entirely a wedge. You could you could draw the line maybe more like that. Um, but at any rate, I do expect us to have one more um, pullback. This yellow line right here, this is the top of this is like the pre-COVID stock market highs, the the pre-COVID 2020 highs. That's what that yellow line is here. So um, I have, this has been a target of mine for quite a long time. Maybe we don't get there, right? Maybe that's too prominent of an area. People start buying it. People front run that. It's very possible. But I do expect that we are going to take some kind of pullback here, um, either December, maybe January. Um, but I'm seeing us, everything is setting up for a big move next year. So again, as I've been saying for the past few weeks, I expect us to make some kind of pullback we will probably touch this line, break the bear market resistance line, and then actually go for a pretty, pretty big run next year. Um, that's kind of a more long-term view. Um, NASDAQ. So what's interesting here is the NASDAQ didn't actually touch the, um, the resistance line, the, the bear market resistance. It, it kind of stopped short and hasn't got there. So it, it is possible that we could kind of just chop sideways for a while, maybe something like that, take a pullback. Um, so I don't know exactly when this pullback is coming, and I wish I could say that with more confidence. Um, but realistically, the numbers that are coming out next week and the Fed meeting next week, that's that's going to drive um, for the most part. I think that's going to drive what will happen for the next month or so. So uh, next um, next price report I have for you guys, we'll talk about the Fed meeting and what I think that um, what I think that means for uh, for where risk assets are going to be going like crypto. Uh, and then finally, we can just take a look at um, the relative movements from the past week. Um, so crypto overall, uh, so you can see that, um, we kind of started the week nice, we pulled back and then we came, kind of came back to neutral. So, uh, again, everything is just kind of flat. Nothing's, nothing really too big is happening here. Um, so 
just, uh, you know, keep on keeping on. If you're DCAing, that's probably not a bad idea to be doing right here. Um, I'm still going to wait to see what the news is next week on the financial numbers, but um, there's a good chance that I could start um, buying buying back some more of my crypto positions um, as this uh, as the news comes out. So, uh, but hopefully, um, if anyone has any questions, you know, you can shoot them in the in the chat here. Uh, Doug, Sunita, I can't hear you guys <laughs> right now. Why. So, uh, actually, you know what I'll do? I'll turn up my volume on the YouTube. Well, buddy. Bye. Great hey. job, uh, <laughs> as always. I'm actually going to go back and listen to this press report again when we, when we finish the show because it was slightly distracted. All I gathered was Monero's uh, Monero's looking good. Looks like we're we're nearing the end of the the bear market. Good time to accumulate. Sounds good to me. Sounds good to me. Let's move it along. Yeah, let's body move can't it hear along. Us. Just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, people Thank that are listening me. in the Twitter spaces, if you can, you know, tweet it out, like the chat. Let's 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 get it out there. We're about to start the. Oh, we hear him. Yeah, I think he's like trying, but. Yeah, body. Uh, just turn turn your thing off over there because we could hear the sound. Um, but yeah, people listening in Twitter space, just please uh, retweet it, get it out there, so we get a bunch of people in the room. Uh, we're going to have the conversation with crypto. Sorry, I uh, unmuted myself for a second. Anyways, thanks, guys. Um, I'll see you guys in the uh, Twitter spaces later on. Okay, cool. Thank <laughs> you. Body's on another another planet. <laughs> I, how, how can you hear us? I don't know why. Like, Usually what changed? Fine. I had nothing changed. We'll have to talk to him about that. Yeah. Get, never, we can never have a no, smooth it's okay. Shot. There's never. always this something. Is, just deal with it. Just embrace It's part of the, the charm. Yeah. It's part of the charm. It's like for the people that have been um, watching it and following <laughs> us for years, they know it's like we've improved significantly. I mean, we're doing a lot issues. of things here with the spaces yeah. and everything. So there, there's, there's. Yeah, I think my computer's tired. We, also, we definitely make it more, uh, more complicated. I think than my computer's space. like slowly dying because it's tired. We need a new computer. We. It's uh, yeah. I think it's yeah. It's obviously. time, you know. It's time. Time to sell some Monero by a computer. <laughs> um, obviously with Monero.